It is September 22nd, 2006. My name is Don Linke. This is another in the series of interviews for the Brendan T. Byrne Archive Project uh, conducted by the Rutgers Program on the Governor. Uh, today we'll be talking with Kenneth McPherson, uh, who was a key policy and political advisor to uh, Governor Byrne uh, and played a significant role in many of the decisions that Governor Byrne made both as a candidate uh, and as governor. Ken, why don't we start with your sort of larger thoughts about Brendan Byrne and his kind of significance uh, in New Jersey policy and politics. Well, well, that's a good place to start. Looking back, anticipating having this, this interview with you, Don, I did think about him in particular as it relates to his I guess you could call it history as it, uh, in relation to him being the governor two times for the state. I think, I think that history will certainly show him as being very effective and very important to the interests of the state. When you look back at his achievements, he was a man of great integrity that had a lot of pressure on him, as most governors do, but with some very large issues as it relates to impacting the, the state. As I look at them, they were all good. They were all advances as it relates to the public interest and really set a tone for the state and the people involved with the politics of the state, if you will, back then. But that was a good one. Well, let's backtrack a little bit and go into your background. You're a product of Hudson County and its special uh, political world. Yeah, Talk a little bit about the background oh, oh, of Hudson oh, County. Okay, I think that's a great advantage to people by way of learning some things as it relates to life in general and also about people and how to deal with them. Uh, I was born and raised in Jersey City. I'm one of uh, five children. I'm, I'm married uh, to a, uh, a, uh, a lady I met in high school at St. Aloysius High School in Jersey City. We have uh, six uh, grown children, all married happily, living close by. And I went to uh, St. Aidan's Grammar School, St. Aloysius High School, St. Peter's College, and Fordham Law School. Uh, basically, that's my, my background in Jersey City. Uh, Were you and I became a lawyer um, when I left the Army service in 19... 50, 58, I guess it was, I was lucky enough to serve for six months on active duty and then seven and a half years out of the ROTC program at the St. Peter's College. Were your parents born in this country? Uh, yes. They were, my father was born in Perth Amboy. My mother was born in Jersey City. And when did the family come to uh, the U.S.? I don't even know that, to be honest. Uh, I guess it was for a couple of generations before my, my mother and father. Uh, my mother's maiden name was McNeil, again, of Scotch ancestry, and my father was McPherson. Uh, so that was basically my uh, family history. What did your father do? He was an electrician uh, and a very skilled uh, a uh, uh, mechanical uh, uh, person could do plumbing and ele electrical work and was very uh, blessed with uh, uh, mechanical skills. Were you the first in the family to attend college? Uh, yes, 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 right. I was the youngest in the family, yes. W was that difficult at the time in terms of finances? Yes, it was. But again, you had then at least to help. That's why I did that. Uh, Quite frankly, it wasn't through any patriotic uh, uh, involvement. Well, I guess it was part of it. But basically, you got a stipend, too, as it relates to some help with the tuition. And back then, the tuitions were at least more reasonable, perhaps, certainly than they are now. Yeah. Uh, was your father politically involved at all? No, none of my family. I was the first one that had anything at all to do with politics. And how did that happen? Well, I guess the way that happened was uh, when you're born and raised in Jersey City, you're aware of the fact that you have a local committeeman and there's a, a Democratic leader and there's a Democratic organization, always Democratic, not very Republican-like. And you had some famous mayors, right? You had uh, Mayor Haig, whom uh, I heard of 
when I was ch a child in uh, grammar school, and then you had the progression of some famous mayors, some not so famous in Jersey City. So you had that kind of a, a an experience that at least gave you an interest in the political system that existed. As a child, when yeah. you first heard of Mayor Haig, was the talk that he was a good man, a corrupt man, or just what? Oh, well, I don't really remember. I was very young then, and I was in grammar school. The one thing that I remember being being told about him is that he always placed a $100 bill in the collection basket at St. Aidan's at Mass every Sunday. So I guess that made him a good man in that sense, yes. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about your first sort of tasks in politics. Well, I didn't have any tasks in politics. Basically, after graduating from law school, uh, from Fordham in 1961, uh, we, I, I took the bar exam and I, I passed the bar exam and was sworn in and was struggling as a lawyer. And quite frankly, the way I became involved in politics was uh, I had heard that there was an, a uh, vacancy or an opening in the Hudson County Prosecutor's Office. And I thought that it would be a good place to begin a legal career as a, as a prosecutor. And I pursued that particular job. You might ask, how did I pursue that? Quite frankly, I pursued that by talking to the then uh, Monsignor McWilliams, who was the pastor of St. Michael's Church in Jersey City, who, who was the pastor of the then Mayor John V. Kenney's uh, uh, parish. Mm -hmm. And I, I spoke to Monsignor McWilliams, to ask him if he would talk to the, the uh, mayor. Well, at that point, he wasn't the mayor. I think he was the uh, Democratic leader. And through that contact, uh, I did get a call, magically, from the uh, prosecutor's office and was offered a job as an assistant prosecutor in Hudson County. And that began uh, my career. It wasn't really politics. At the, well, I guess it is to the extent that you get the position through political contacts, uh, but it was just being an assistant prosecutor in Hudson County. And by this time, uh, Kenny had become mayor? No, Kenny had been the mayor before then. Um, I forgot when it was. I think 49 was when he ousted uh, the then uh, mayor, who wasn't Mayor Haig, but his nephew or something. I mm -hmm. forgot about Hag Eggers, I think his name was, but but he was just the Democratic leader behind the scenes, and indeed didn't hold any public office at the time, but was the uh, the unquestioned uh, political powerhouse in Hudson County. John V. Kenny was. Mm. Yes. Did you have any personal contact with him? Uh, uh, personal contact, no, but but I did have an interesting one interesting conversation with him, and, and that was. Uh, and I've forgotten a year, but I was then an assistant prosecutor in Hudson County. You had had the then warden of the Hudson County Jail uh, indicted by Robert Morgenthau from New York for transporting women to the Hudson County Jail. And it was a big uh, um, investigation and uh, scandal as it relates to the conditions at the Hudson County Jail. And I do remember he called one, I think it was a Sunday morning, and asked if I would uh, agree to become the acting warden of the Hudson County Jail. Uh, I agreed to do that because he made it clear over the telephone that, quote, to, to quote him, that you don't have to do any favors and I've, I've got the support of the freeholders that they would give you whatever funding you need to clean the jail up. And I did agree to become the acting warden of the Hudson County Jail. I left the prosecutor's office and for really a period of one year <laughs> ran the Hudson County Jail, which was the most exciting year of my life, I guess. Why, why is that? Well, it was in a very bad state, quite frankly. It was uh, uh, tremendously overpopulated. There was uh, a, a lack of, of uh, discipline and integrity, quite frankly through the whole system, and it was challenging to the extent that while you could get the, the funding to make physical improvements uh, in the jail, you know, such basic things as improving the menus and adding more uh, uh, correction offices and whatnot, it, it was difficult because it was a, a terrible situation that had to be corrected. And I'm especially proud of having, I think, done a, a very good job uh, for that one year 
uh, in cleaning it up, mm -hmm. you know, putting it on the right track, getting, getting some of the prisoners out of there, reducing the population, increasing the staff. It was that kind of thing. For a young man, it was a little crazy, I guess, to do it, but because of the, the, the obvious difficulty of it. But, but, it, but it was something I thought was in the public interest and, uh, you know, served my, my uh, career well to the extent that I was proud of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you mentioned that you got the prosecutor's you know, job primarily through the church through the Monsignor's yes, yes, call. Yes. Did you develop any other sort of uh, political affiliations or have any political mentors who helped you as you as you go further? Well, not really, because again, I was lucky uh, as it relates to uh, my. Uh, a political involvement, if you want to call that, because it was always in the context of that history, namely having, I think, done a pretty good job as an assistant prosecutor. I thought doing a very good job with the jail situation. And and then I was lucky enough, too, to, to be appointed from the jail job to be appointed the uh, secretary of the Division of Tax Appeals in Trenton, which was, I guess, my only state employment um, and at that time, the Division of Tax Appeals handled all real estate property tax appeals throughout the state, and that uh, was very helpful to uh, uh, my uh, legal career, knowing a little bit about uh, real estate taxes. And did real someone estate. suggest that position to you, or did you seek it out? No, that was suggested by the then chairman of the Freeholder Board, I think the freeholders at that point in Hudson County were great, grateful, were, uh, what shall I say, were probably happy that the jail thing was corrected. It was on the right track and uh, recognized, too, that I, that wasn't a career for me. I, you mm. know, it was just a temporary <laughs> assignment, mm. so to speak. So because you had done a good job at the jail, they thought that yes. they, they would sort of suggest this as another career move. Yes, yes, yes. And at the time, too, they were generous enough at the time to recommend my deceased partner, uh, uh, David Waters, to become the secretary of the board. Of the, it's not, I think it was the PUC at the time. It's now the Board of Public Utilities. Yeah, the former Public Utilities Commission. Yes. And at the time, too, the, the then president of the, of the board was Brendan Byrne. Okay. Well, let's move a little forward. You're, uh -huh. st you're still, uh, you still haven't met Brendan Byrne. Let's uh, Correct. Talk. Yes. At that point, I, I may have seen him at a prosecutor's convention or something like that, but I really didn't know him. But I had, uh, as I think most people did back then, an admiration for uh, his image as it was projected through his, uh, his uh, activities and, and the publicity surrounding all the good work he did as a prosecutor of uh, Essex County. He was sort of like the model uh, uh, prosecutor in the state of New Jersey at the time. Had you heard of him before he went up to Essex County from Trenton? Not really, no, because again, I wasn't that deeply meshed in politics. When he, you're talking about when he was down with the Governor, Governor Myers, Myers serving as executive secretary or whatever he was. No, I really didn't uh, pay attention to him then. Although I think if you look back, that, that uh, part of his career was, was probably uh, well noted and, and uh, well done. And at some You can tell I'm a fan, yes. <laughs> okay. yeah. At some point, uh, you're nominated as prosecutor. Talk uh, about the background of well, that, that was, nomination. Well, that was interesting to the extent that this, I was nominated by the then Governor Hughes uh, in 1969 to be the prosecutor of Hudson County. And I guess at that point it was an honor to the extent that every assistant prosecutor probably thinks that he or she ought to be the prosecutor. And, and it was a, a process of elimination, I think, as it relates to the then uh, Hudson County powers that be, because you had then in, in 69, you had the, the uh, U.S. Attorney Fred Lacey and Herb Stern doing that uh, and wonderful job of investigating corruption in Hudson County. Uh, and you had the involvement of uh, John V. Kenney and Tom Whalen and uh, a 
whole group of uh, Hudson County politicians that were, uh, I think, uh, uh, properly prosecuted as it relates to the corrupt atmosphere that was still present but waning at the time. And, and you had then, too, uh, a, a takeover in the good sense of the uh, Hudson County Democratic Organization by a, a group of uh, reformers, uh, young Paul Jordan, the doctor who became mayor, Bernie Hartnett, who went on to other great things as it relates to his chief advisor. You had then, to the, the takeover of the organization, the Hudson County organization, by the then uh, maverick, by way of the history of the, 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 the uh, perhaps corrupt uh, Hudson County Democratic organization, uh, alleged, allegedly anyway, of Francis Fitzpatrick, who was the mayor of Bayonne and a man of unquestioned integrity and, and uh, quite a, a personality. And it was a good thing to the extent that you had like this breath of fresh air. And more than that, you had actual control of the Hudson County organization at that point by a group of people that were uh, uh, of uh, great integrity and intelligence mm. and, and publicly interested. Mm. Why don't you talk more about Mayor Fitzpatrick because he's a key player in the story. <laughs> well, he, he was a very, I, I chuckle when I think of him, and I think of him fondly because he was a, 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 an imposing figure with a big voice and, and was very, very outspoken as it relates to his resistance to uh, the, the then Hudson County Democratic politicians, quite frankly and was a voice of, of rebellion, if you will, by way of going his own way, having a good reputation, uh, running the city of Bayonne, building, which was something unique back then, a, a modern, up-to-date municipal facility uh, in Bayonne. He, he, he was quite a figure. Uh, I, I think fondly of him. We... At this time, we always still think of Jersey City as sort of the dominant player in Hudson County. How did he sort of escape the organization? Well, well, well he was always, again, his own man as it relates to running Bayonne. And, and when, when you had the 1969, uh, 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 I, I, I forgot what the name was, the Hudson County Nine investigated and prosecuted in the uh, federal uh, district court. You had the ability then to come in and elect a Paul Jordan in Jersey City as the mayor. You had then a more outgoing, inclusive, democratic leadership, and it probably made sense. And I wasn't involved with those people because, again, I was busy being a lawyer and doing the things that I was doing. Uh, but you had uh, the, the, the sense then of, of having a, uh, to share the wealth, to have a Democratic leader that was beyond Jersey City, quite frankly, including the whole county. So it was that context in which uh, you, you, you have to place, I guess, ultimately my involvement going on with uh, Governor Byrne. With your nomination as prosecutor, uh, where's there are other sort of candidates, or were you the sole <laughs> Well, I'm sure there was a lot of candidates beyond me. But at any rate, I was the one that used, uh, accepted. And why do you think he did? <laughs> well, first of all, they, as you know, they do a, a serious background check on you. I guess I had a good reputation, I hope anyway, I had a good reputation as an assistant prosecutor. I did clean up the Hudson County Jail, and I, you know, I wasn't deeply enmeshed in the political system. You know, I was just a lawyer. Were there political opponents within Hudson County opposing your nomination? Back then, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> yes. But yeah. you, you don't recall who? They're probably all dead. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. I do recall, but yeah, 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 yes, there was some opposition to that. And you were nominated in pros as prosecutor in what year? Uh, I think it was in February of 1969. It languished before the Senate. You had then the, uh, the, uh, the race for governor between Minor again and Bill Cahill. Bill Cahill <laughs> got a lot of support, I think, from the Hudson County uh, Democratic Organization and, and, and uh, was successful in being elected governor uh, over Minor. 
and the nomination before the then Senate died because every governor wants to appoint, I would think anyway, mm -hmm. someone whom he would choose as prosecutor of s s Hudson County, certainly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's backtrack a, yeah. a bit. Yeah. Um, I assume that you met with Governor Hughes before he oh, yeah. made the nomination. Yeah, yeah. He's a, what was it? What was that meeting like? I don't remember it other than being very pleasant. If you know the governor, if you've read of him, he was a unique man. He had an ability to, to relate to people and put people at ease very, very quickly. He was, uh, uh, what shall I say, always positive and enthusiastic. He was a pleasure to be with. And he's a fellow, too, uh, that, that, that with him being the governor, he would talk to you as if uh, you, too, were a governor almost. He had uh, great skills. And your nomination got held up because of the, the politics. politics and the election. It's in the middle yeah. of the election, therefore you're not going to get a nomination like that back then anyway, maybe still, out of the Senate as it relates to that type of a, uh, important position to the state and the county. And what was the partisan division of the Senate at that time? I don't remember. I'm trying to think back. Was it a Republican majority? I think it was. I think it was because, yes, it was. Because it couldn't even get out of committee. Okay. Yeah. Now, were there any efforts by the governor's staff or others to s try to work something out? Oh, yeah, sure. You had that, that play. But, but uh, you know, that, that, they, they, it didn't work. Yeah, right. Okay. But anyway, that, that was fine by me. It was uh, quite an honor having been nominated. And it was in, in that context that I really did become at least familiar with uh, Brendan Byrne and helped by him. Helped to the extent that with the nomination, not knowing what the hell to do from then on in, you know, as it relates to uh, being the prosecutor, which is different than an assistant prosecutor, uh, through Dave Waters, who was working with him at the BPU or the Peace Public Utilities Commission, uh, I did meet with uh, the governor and chat with, chatted with him as it relates to that that process. And he was uh, fun and uh, to be with, and certainly generous with his advice as it relates to that. Of course, he had had his own problems in getting full confirmation as yes. prosecutor in yes. Essex County. Yes, yes, it was a similar situation if you go back then. You know, if you go back to the history of the then Essex County uh, organization. And what was your sort of conversation like with Governor Byrne? Uh, I don't really remember other than, you know, uh, treating it lightly, but yet being serious enough to realize that here's a guy who has gone through the same thing, done a very good job, and, and has uh, moved on. And, and uh, there was a... Uh, what shall I say, a rapport between us that uh, was uh, nice, mm -hmm. nice. Well, let's, let's move And again, you've got to remember then, Don, too, you had these great articles being written by a then f uh, very uh, respected reporter for the New York Times. Uh, uh, his, name is, uh, his name was Ron, Ron Sullivan, Ronald Sullivan. And he had like a, an ongoing series of, of uh, plugs or articles promoting uh, Brendan Byrne for the governorship because of his track record and having been the successful prosecutor and doing a good job with the with the uh, Public Utilities Commission and indeed being at that point in time as it relates to now you're getting into the early 70s he, he became the assignment judge of Morris uh, County and had a good uh, reputation uh, as an assignment judge. So you had these, this, this wonderful um, what should I say, resume or whatever you want to call it of, of achievement uh, by the way of uh, his work, uh, Brendan's, uh, Burns' work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you go back to private practice? Yes, yeah, yes. I like being a lawyer, yeah. Did you ever appear before Judge Burns? No, 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 no. What was your next contact with him? Well, <laughs> that was funny too, to the extent that uh, it, it, what, with, with the election of Cahill, 
I didn't see him or really have any interaction with him until uh, April of 1973. It was during the uh, recess of the court for the holidays for Easter and, and the Passover that uh, I got a call from from him, or David Waters may have gotten a call, wanting to stop by to chat. Uh, at this point, he's the assignment judge of Morris County. And he stopped by our office on Journal Square over the shoe store. And it was kind of funny to the extent that he, he kind of came into my office, sat in my chair, kind of took over the office uh, with his great presence and sense of humor and began to s discuss uh, uh, potentially running for governor. And you've got to put this in the context of, at that point, Cahill, uh, God rest his soul, some of his close uh, advisors and uh, may have been even cabinet le level members were uh, indicted and, and uh, had criminal corruption charges. So it, it was apparent to a lot of people that given that uh, baggage, if you will, that uh, uh, Cahill was, was vulnerable by way of uh, a second term election. And, and uh, walking into the office, I think, uh, on that day, uh, Brendan, Brendan Byrne had also spoken with the then um, uh, county chairman of Union County, a fellow by the name of Chris Dietz, and his deputy director, Donald Land. And I guess both Dietz and Land were also enamored with the fact that this would be a great candidate for governor, namely Brendan Byrne, and had indicated that if he did choose to run, that they would support him, which meant giving him the Union County line. And back then, you got to remember that the county chairman, chair people were very powerful. They are now, too, but I don't think as powerful as they were back then, in 73 even. And you had, and you had him, meaning Byrne, coming, the scenario would be coming off the bench, so to speak, with absolutely no political organization, nothing other than his reputation, running for governor. And, you know, a great story, but still the practicality of it was he had no, no troops, no f uh, political, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, organization. organization, if you will, in place. So at any rate, I guess he was talking to me because of the fact that he had the experience with me with the, uh, uh, with the, the prosecuting nomination back in 69. I thought he must have gotten a good feel as it relates to that and thought that I could give him some advice and help with, you guessed it, uh, getting the support for the Hudson County, uh, from the Hudson County uh, then Democratic Organization which was, again, head, uh, headed by uh, the then Mayor Fitzpatrick. Now, you want to ask me how... <laughs> okay. Evidently, the, the, the reason why I think Byrne was sensitive to Hudson County was obviously he wanted to be comfortable with the, the, the people involved with, with the, uh, uh, the Democratic organization then, and, and I thought he trusted and had uh, some uh, respect for my judgment as to the ability. And the big issue here was integrity, basically. And, and yet he did have uh, a, a, a concern with the then mayor Fitzpatrick because I guess he had heard, too, that, God rest his soul, <laughs> Mayor Fitzpatrick had, had difficulties with not Brendan Byrne, but Governor Minor. To this day, I don't know what that difficulty was. He may have told me, and I've forgotten about it. But, but the, the talk on the street was that he didn't want anything to do with meaning uh, Mayor Fitzpatrick, with anybody who had anything to do with Governor Minor. I don't know what that story is. Uh, it probably is some political involvement. 
I'm sure involving some benefit to Bayonne that was absent or something. But, but recognizing that uh, Brendan asked if I would uh, help, not help him, but ask my judgment as to how to deal with that issue. Um, so we, you know, and again, the time was compressed here because you had the filing deadline. He had no, nobody even signed petitions to, to get on the ballot. So, so it was kind of, uh, uh, what shall I say, intense, the, the time pressures. So we concluded that I would go on my own and sit down with Mayor Fitzpatrick, which I did on a couple of occasions, I think two, two, maybe three visits. And, you know, I went through the, oh, he is the usual. Oh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's got to be like minor. As a matter of fact, the comical thing I thought was he must have seen a picture in one of the papers of Brendan Byrne playing tennis with Bob Minor. <laughs> he showed me that picture, which I thought back then, you know, of course I didn't laugh. But when you think about it, to connect someone from a picture playing tennis shows like the the human aspect of the relationship to be and the the craziness of it. But at any rate, I assured him that no, no, no. And at the time, it's funny to me, I, I never met Minor at the time. But I was assuring him just from my uh, feeling for Brendan Byrne <laughs> that he couldn't have been like Minor because he was such a, a great candidate, such a good guy, sense of humor, integrity, smart as hell, that kind of thing. So, so anyway, I finally got, I finally got uh, the, the, the mayor to agree to meet with him, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and again, you had the compression of the time with the filing. So it was a rainy night, and, and then Don Land, who was the, I forgot what his title was, the, the indication of the Union County support for Byrne, uh, myself and Brendan, and the, uh, Governor Byrne, and the, Brendan Byrne, then Judge Byrne, uh, went to the mayor's office. And the way I had structured it is that they would meet one on one and talk through whatever difficulties uh, the mayor had with. with Burn as it relates to minor, <laughs> I guess, uh, and and uh, I w I waited in the waiting room with Don, uh, uh, the Burn Burn and Fitzpatrick, and Fitzpatrick insisted at the time of having Jim Dugan present in that that conference too, and and uh, who was a senator from Bayonne and a confidant of uh, of uh, Mayor Fitzpatrick, and one of the back then young new faces in politics like by way of controlling the Hudson County Democratic Party in a good sense. And they had a conversation and uh, maybe 20 minutes later uh, Byrne came out of the office, was, uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, uh, frustrated, I would use the word, with, with that conversation. <laughs> we uh, left. Mayor Fitzpatrick comes out and says he's just like Minor. I don't know what the hell that meant. What what that meant? But obviously, it was some crazy pol past political uh, Governor Minor Bayonne uh, controversy or some lack of follow through for a Bayonne benefit, something like that. But at any rate. You could imagine how frustrated or excited or nervous at that point I am because I thought that this was a perfect combination. Namely, you had two people of great integrity. They were very smart, and it was, you know, something that would work and be good for, for good for the uh, the state. So anyway, we we left the office and and we ducked into a restaurant and Lan and Byrne and myself uh, spoke. <laughs> I'll never forget it because I ordered a Jack Daniels at that point. I needed a drink, and they brought me a Jack Rose. If you if you drink, you know that there's a big difference. <laughs> but at any rate, I banged down the Jack Rose, and, and we had a a, uh, a uh, conversation about that. And I don't even remember what it was, but it was that kind of silly human thing that w ought not prevent the combination that would lead to his being the governor. 
So I left and went and uh, sat in the back of uh, the car and spoke with uh, Mayor Fitzpatrick and uh, Jim Dugan at the time. And the, the basic sales pitch, if it was, and it was sort of like that to the extent that both of them recognized, both interests, that it was good for both of them and good for the state of New Jersey. So, uh, emphasizing the fact that with one, one dramatic involvement, you could have, number one, a governor, okay, that everybody would be proud of, and number two, you'd have Hudson County, you know, the, with a history of corruption, all of a sudden lifted into the, into the good, good guy uh, category, if you will, by backing this man of great integrity. And uh, he, they, they both recognized that that was a good thing. And we agreed to meet and, uh, again same night. And now you're getting uh, maybe 10 o'clock. So again, you have the time compression. So we went over to Mayor Fitzpatrick's uh, house, quite frankly. His lovely wife was there. Uh, and and uh, the governor and, and Francis Fitzpatrick, the mayor, sat on his porch. And, and at that point, the, whatever that controversy was or that argument over something Governor Minot did really was insignificant. They both recognized the fact that it would be a good thing for the state and for Hudson County to endorse them. Uh, they, they, Mayor Fitzpatrick agreed to do that. Uh, then, and again, it's what, 10, 11 o'clock at this point. It, then Jim Dugan was astute enough to recognize that and to choreograph, if you will, and that was his doing, not mine, um, a, a dramatic announcement of the candidacy and uh, we were going to do that the next day, uh, and and uh, also Jim was astute enough to also recognizing that you have Union County, you have the big Hudson County, and our friend Jerry Breslin was then the Democratic chairman, I believe, of Bergen County. At the time, Bergen, the Democratic Party in Bergen County wasn't very powerful, to say the least, quite frankly. But Jerry recognizing again the the the, the the benefit, if you will, to the state and Bergen County too, of having him as a candidate, agreed also to be part of that announcement down in Trenton, the next day. And again, I was at the at the time he lived in West Orange on I never forget it Nymph Place, <laughs> and 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 I picked him up in my old Buick and we drove down to Trenton. Uh, he went into uh, Cahill's office announced that he was uh, resigning from uh, the bench. Um, by that time, everybody alerted the uh, Trenton Press Corps, if you will. You had all the photographers. One picture I kept uh, of him and myself as him and myself coming out of the Governor Cahill's office after that announcement. And, and thereafter, I mean, the public reaction to it was, was very, very uh, good. It was on all the radio stations. All the newspapers carried it. And he had a terrific leg up. And again, now you have the problem of uh, the basic uh, political organization that he's still lacking. But he had now to the extent that certainly the Hudson County people could certainly get petitions signed, et cetera, Bergen County too and Union County. Uh, and, and, and that was an exciting day. I think we all walked down the block to the then hotel. I've forgotten the name of it on State Street chatted a bit. Uh, we concluded that we would, he would, wasn't me, it was basically him, use uh, his old law office in West Orange uh, with uh, Marty Greenberg and Harold Telser at the time were running it as a base of operation to begin the process of uh, running for governor. Do you remember who else was there in the State House at that announcement on his well, team? I know he and I were there, but uh, I'm sure there were others at that point. Got to remember, too, now you had a multiplicity of candidates uh, in the Democratic primary. You had Ralph DeRose, a senator that had Essex County. Brendan Burns, home county. Home county, right. And, and he was the, the, the vigorous anti-income tax uh, can, uh, candidate. You had the then Dick Coffey, who was the senator from Mercer County. You had uh, Ed Craybill, who was this, I think he was a senator from Middlesex County. You had 
uh, I think Ann Klein, who was a uh, famous, well, you know, a, 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 I've forgotten what her involvement was, but she was running for governor also in the primary. And you probably had maybe, uh, you probably had somebody from Passaic, I've forgotten who. But anyway, you had a multiplicity of candidates. And obviously with the, with the great publicity from the announcement, uh, he, he was the hot candidate. One candidate who yeah. did not enter the race but was talked about as a potential candidate was Congressman Helstosky. How would that have affected Brendan Burns' decision to enter? They wouldn't have. You don't think so? Nah. Uh, now he, 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 he's, very, he's very bright, I mean, obviously. And he was, he, well, he's probably wiser than that too, but was, I was just going to say he was equally bright back then. But he, he had a good sense of the politics of it. He, he didn't need too much advice as it relates to uh, being able to deal with the, the political issues and the, and the personalities. Mm -hmm. From your view in Hudson County, yeah. uh, talk a little more about the background of the Essex County political situation at the time well, I and guess, who the key players were. Well, the key player then was probably Harry, he was, Harry Lerner, who over the years I became friendly with too, like especially with the second election. But, but he was a strong uh, Democratic leader of Essex County. Essex County, uh, uh, way back then too, didn't have a sterling reputation as it relates to to uh, uh, it, its uh, its uh, position in the state, uh, and and as I remember, Alex De Rose was a a, a handsome uh, senator who who uh, had the support of his county, and that meant a lot of votes. And his platform was no income tax, no income tax, because you had the usual budget crises and school funding way back then, but. Uh, and and I, I think that they, they, they were the, the main uh, uh, opponents in, in the primary. Mm -hmm. Now you want to know how we got them out? Mm -hmm. yeah, he got them out, basically. The first, I, <laughs> um, the first meeting that we had was with, with other candidates, was with uh, the then candidate, uh, Senator Coffey who was, again, a very astute politician, a man of integrity, and had already positioned himself with a top-flight, sophisticated, fairly well-funded, too, I think, uh, uh, organization, political organization. He, he had, I think, on board a guy by the name of John Montella, Montella, I think his name was, who was very... He may still be in business. I don't know. He was very uh, uh, well regarded in the direct mail business, and and the whole uh, sophistication of political campaigning was just kind of mushrooming then. But Dick Coffey had that 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 uh, organization in place, and he had a couple of very bright young men around him. One of which was my friend Dick Leone, who was uh, and 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 is. Uh, as bright as hell, wonderful man, uh, and uh, Luke Caden, I think was no, I think Luke Caden was from Middlesex County. But at any rate, we met one one night at uh, the the uh, the then offices of the of the coffee campaign. I remember it because they ordered from the then famous Lorenzo's restaurant <laughs> steak dinners for everyone, which was kind of amusing to me, but also a nice gesture. And they put on a show for us, not a show in a bad sense, but they went through, uh, and Dick Leon principally, uh, his plan for uh, uh, advancing the candidacy of then uh, Dick Coffey. And indeed it was well organized, well managed, and well thought out. And I guess the, 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 the point there was to see if you couldn't reach an accommodation so that you, I guess their desire, but I don't think they were obviously wedded to it, to hope that maybe Brendan would, would support him and not run. Uh, again, that was another situation whereby I think Brendan spoke with, uh, uh, with Coffey one-on-one, -on -one, 
uh, shook hands, and we walked out of there with uh, coffee dropping out, him supporting Byrne, and picking up the real invaluable asset of the background of an intelligence and ability of Dick Leone and their, their in-place political organization. So that was a big, big help towards electing him. Uh, then as you progress, another interesting part, and again, you got to put it in the context of the then just emerging, um, not to demean, uh, sophisticated campaigning. It wasn't as nasty as it can get now, but it was, I guess, moving to that direction. The next thing Leon came up with, uh, uh, engaging uh, a media advisor, and that was the now famous uh, Dave Goth, who was himself quite a personality, if you've ever met him, and he still is, and he's still a friend of mine. I haven't seen him in a couple of years, but occasionally we would talk, and uh, he's done. He's helped me in, in the past with some help in New York and uh, with. Uh, the Giuliani administration, but, 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 the 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 and and the, by the way, D Dave Goff had as his second in command the famous Jeff Greenfield, whom you see on CNN as the political analyst, or I think they call him senior analyst now. I don't know what that that means, but it's some sort of honor. Uh, but the meeting with Byrne and Leon and myself. And, and Goth and Greenf Greenfield was quite interesting because Goth had just had a couple of spectacular political victories throughout the country and, and right away came up with the uh, slogan for Byrne, the man who couldn't be bought, as it relates to the fact that at the time you had a, 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 a book written about uh, an investigation of mob figures in New Jersey were in, they were uh, audio taped uh, t discussing the mob figures, discussing uh, corrupt politicians, and the famous line was, I guess, by the then Gyp De Carlo, uh, who's mentioned in the Broadway play Jersey Boys, if you've seen it, as one of the, the back then uh, 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 corrupt, uh, uh, not politician, but gangster type. Matter of fact, I think, I think uh, uh, the Four Seasons played at the first inauguration ball for Brendan Byrne. There was no connection, but it's funny the way things evolved. But but anyway, Gyp De Carlo had a famous quote where he said, "You can't buy him." So that was uh, the the motto for for Byrne, and. Uh, my role with him then was just kind of, first, for the first week, it was uh, taxing to the extent that we didn't even have a, a car or anything like that. So I would wind up driving him. He'd be sleeping in the back seat after making a couple of stops, and neither one of us really, he did, I shouldn't say that. I was just going to say neither one of us knew what, not, what, quite what the hell we were doing, I guess. But it, it was all good, and people sensed that here you had a unique individual in him uh, that would be good for everybody. How much time during the day did you spend campaigning with him? Oh man, the first couple of weeks, all day. It was like, it was so much that, you know, it was difficult just uh, uh, sleeping, taking care of your family, and uh, running your law practice. To tell you the truth, that probably suffer, suffered a bit back then. But it was great, well, beyond fun. It was great fun, but also there was a sense of purpose there was a sense of, of uh, success. You knew, that, got a feeling that you're going to win. So it was a great, great, great time. And, and we, we, we did get the other people out, too. When I say we, he did basically by the strength of his position and the public reaction to him. And I think it wound up that the real opponent turned out to be uh, DeRose. And if you recall, he, he beat him overwhelmingly in the primary. How and then he got lucky, too, because you've got to remember, Sandman then was the candidate for the Republicans with the conservative vote uh, reacting to, I guess, the, the difficulties that Cahill had. Well, let's go back uh, to those early days of yeah. the campaign. Oh, man. How was he as a candidate? Well, hesitant to begin with. I'll never forget the first speech I heard him give 
in a political context as a candidate. And that was at a, uh, a dinner in Passaic County, Patterson or Passaic, I can't remember, with, with the then leader was, um, uh, what's, uh, I've forgotten his name. You may remember it. Uh, it'll come to me. Basically, Tony Grossi, he was also a commissioner at the BPU at the time and naturally supported Byrne. And it was a group uh, at a dinner, and we got there late, and he introduced uh, Brent and Byrne, and it was just Byrne and myself, and he gave a speech. Uh, and again, what always saved him was his uh, self-deprecating sense of humor. And he struggled, uh, and he'll probably admit that, through that first speech. And it was the beginning of the process, and, and certainly as it evolved with that same to this day, engaging, self-deprecating sense of humor that, that, that serves him well and can uh, deliver a message and, and instill confidence in, in his decision making. What did he like and not like about the day-to-day -day campaign? Well, you probably know, uh, <laughs> what did he not like? Well, I guess he didn't like the, the, the intensity of it and the constancy of it. Uh, and, and also, it, it was totally consuming so that, uh, you know, you had little family life and little, little time to play tennis, for instance. <laughs> and he was always a good athlete to this day. I'm sure he, he plays tennis. I never played tennis with him. I could. I only played basketball with him. I always beat them. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's uh, move into the campaign. Yeah. Uh, you were fairly confident he was going to win. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, he was too. I mean, it was it was it was working. You know, you could sense it. The reaction of the people, uh, and and he's very good one on one. He was very good working a room, so to speak. You know, with his warmth and his his whole presence. He wouldn't say it, but I'd say it was almost easy back then. Now, the second time around, it was a little different. Were you surprised, as many people were, that Congressman Sandman defeated uh, Governor Cahill I, in the I primary? I didn't think of it that much then because we were so busy doing what we were doing. I don't know, surprised, we were happy because it was such a contrast between the two positions on the issues, you know, that it was, it was a as they say now, a clear choice, that made it a clear choice. Mm -hmm. he, he would have beaten, in my judgment, Cahill anyway, though, because mm -hmm. it was there, you know, I mean, there was, and, and also another way is the, the, the response uh, to, to him by way of political contributions. You, you had people wanting to contribute to him, to his, to his uh, campaign, and the money helped back then, too. Now, you've talked about a few of the people in the campaign, and as, as the campaign progresses, more come into uh, the fold. Uh, who are the ones that you remember? <laughs> well, I certainly remember the Leon entrance, and because he ran it, he was the brains, he was the heart, he was the glue of that whole campaign. And, and while looking back now, and from my point of view, dealing with the constancy of being with him early on, it was very comforting to know that you had this very bright guy, loyal to him, with unquestioned integrity, Dick Leone, managing it. And you had also, at that point, Caden was a big part of it. Very bright guy. He had run for congressman, I think, against a, a uh, I've forgotten his name, Patton or something, in Middlesex County had lost. So he had the political involvement and base, too, and, and, and uh, was very instrumental in, in articulating the positions that we, he took, uh, I was going to say we, he took throughout the, uh, the, uh, the race, the uh, first uh, race against uh, Sandman. Uh, others, I'm sure there was a lot that I've forgotten. Ultimately, we got Harry Lerner, he got Harry Lerner over uh, to support him, obviously, after the primary. That was a big help because you had then, too, the, Demo the Democratic organization in Essex County supporting its, its, its favorite son at that point, second favorite son. <laughs> but it was a nice thing. It worked, it worked 
very, very well. And of course, you mentioned Essex County again, and uh, yeah. Marty Greenberg, who you mentioned before, had a fairly big role. Big role. Yes, he did, and that's and the Charlie Corella, and that's election. the pardon me, and a somewhat confusing political position in that election, didn't he? Yes, he was running for senator on the DeRose. We finished. Oh, okay, we were, he was running for senator on the DeRose ticket. I, I forgot that, which was a cute too. Because he was so close to Brendan Byrne, well, but his partners. home county They was, were partners. They were partners, yeah. And his home county was, was yes. backing another yes. candidate against yes. Brendan Byrne. Yes, yes. I mean, that, that's a great story, too, when you think about it. Why don't we, and he was elected, too. Yeah. Why don't we break now for a That'd couple minutes? That would be a good months. idea. Yeah. Okay. I'll be back. Ken, now that uh, Brendan Byrne has won the 1973 primary, yes. you were <laughs> extremely confident that he could beat Congressman Sandman in November? Yes. Because you saw that the contrasts in their positions were so stark. It was stark. Yes, stark is a good word. Well, what was the mood in the campaign like? Were there pessimists who said that uh, there Never. were... There... No. There was always a, a, a positive... Uh, thrust of the campaign. Again, you got to credit, uh, if anyone was cautiously optimistic and cautious in the judgment making, I'd have to attribute that to Leon. He was always moderating and, you know, uh, cautious about how uh, he dealt with the issues and how they positioned the whole effort during the campaign. And how about Brendan Burns' confidence in victory? We, we, we never spoke when we were traveling around together about whether we were confident or not. Number one, it was, again, too intense, too, too fast-moving. And also, you know, it was just natural. I don't think we ever had a discussion about whether or not he was going to win. I don't think. But it was always there. I mean, uh, you know, we always, I, I, I would think he thought he was going to win, but maybe not. I mean, you know, I don't know. But I certainly thought he was going to win. One of the now, I, and when I say that, too, again, you, you don't stop to discuss that, I mean, when you're in that mode of trying to get elected. At least w w we didn't. Did you make suggestions to him as to how he could improve his campaign style? Oh, oh, uh, that was more like a uh, Leon type uh, suggestion, maybe around the edges occasionally. Was it more in speaking or? Uh... Well, well, you know, sometimes, sometimes uh, having some sense of, of, of uh, what issue or what person we were dealing with, I might give him my take or judgment on that person. I remember the first television interview he had. Uh, he and I went over to, to uh, or, uh, it was, the, he's still around, Gabe Pressman. Mm -hmm. I think that was the first television uh, uh, appearance of Byrne. Again, in the primary, and and the big concern driving over was, you know, they're going to ask you the tax, the income tax question, and and I think I don't know who takes credit for that, but I think we discussed uh, how to deal with that because, in truth, he he thought that you didn't have to enact an income tax right then, but he was cautious of the fact that you may had have, have had to do that, recognizing. Not fully, because he probably didn't have a chance to study the the the, the intricacies of the budget requirements, et cetera, uh, to be. And I think the famous line that came up uh, on that is, not in a foreseeable future. I think uh, somebody came up with that line when asked whether or not you would en enact an income tax, because that was the issue, the contrast between him and and uh, and Alex DeRose. Alex DeRose's platform was he will not enact an income tax. At the time, New Jersey did not, NOT, have an income tax. 
can you remember who came up with the foreseeable future phrase? I don't know. He did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But it, but it was it was valid at the at that point. I mean, I I wouldn't want to put it in a position whereby you knew going in there you had to do it and you and you wouldn't admit that because mm. indeed you didn't. You, you got to put it in the context. He's he's a judge. He's running for governor. Recognizes broadly the 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 economic state of the of uh, certainly the school funding and the budget. And and you don't know how you're going to be able to to deal with the budget concerns once you're in office. So from that standpoint, it was a legitimate thing to say. Well, was there anyone in the campaign arguing that since Brendan Byrne was so far ahead of Congressman Sandman, yeah, uh, that he should have dealt more forthrightly with the state's fiscal situation and suggested the need for some major reform of, of public finance? I think he did deal forthrightly with it, honestly, done to the extent that you knew it was out there, but you didn't want to say now that you had to do that. And with, with the language that you choose to articulate your position, I thought it was a fair articulation of it, quite frankly. Okay. Well, let's go to election day. What, yeah. what was election day and election night like? <laughs> well, very exciting. Very exciting. Oh, which will I, the primary? The primary, de dealing with that, I remember riding down to the headquarters with him in the back of the car on the radio. They were announcing he was the winner already before he even got there. So that was like just a lot of fun and, and satisfaction. And then with the ultimate victory, it was, I think, it was someplace in West Orange. I've forgotten the place. Um, I think uh, Sheila, my wife, came to that and all, and it was like a wonderful uh, celebration of a uh, great victory. And you got to remember, too, through this, you, you got a guy who's special, special to the extent that you had unquestioned ability, questioned integrity, you know, you had the whole package, so to speak, you know. And he looked good, he photographed well. I mean, it was a, like, like out of a movie, uh, you know, here's a great candidate. And, and he was especially gracious uh, when he made his acceptance speech. He, he went out of his way to mention my name along with, with Leon and Don Lynn and Jim Dugan. And he went through that ritual of, of distinguishing uh, to the public. And I remember people hearing it on television and calling me about it and being, uh, you know, prideful as it relates to having that special recognition. Mm. Uh, even before he gets uh, inaugurated as governor, he has to deal with an issue uh, <laughs> close to where we are uh, yes, sitting yes, right yes, now. Yes. Talk about that. Well, that was a, a you know, you got to look at that too. That achievement was partly uh, Bill Cahill's, having the vision to, to put in place uh, uh, the uh, sports complex, if you will, with a racetrack and giant stadium and, and the benefits to New Jersey. Uh, that, that was a great accomplishment initially on the part of the Cahill administration, Cahill. Uh, but you had intense pressure from other interests uh, on uh, him as the governor-elect to abort or to abandon, maybe is a better word, that whole effort. And you had also, if you recall reading the newspapers, the threat of a lack of financing for the project as it relates to the New York banks at that point taking the position that it would be in such competition with the New York interest that they really didn't want to fund it and there was questions about whether or not it would be successful. You had then him having all that pressure, Brendan Byrne, and uh, we st he stood up to that and went forward with the project. And God rest his soul, I remember Tom Stanton, who was then the president and chairman of the board of the I think it was the first Jersey National Bank who was the first uh, man at the banking institution to set up, s step up and support the bonds necessary to, to go forward with that project. But that was a, a typically uh, Brendan Byrne looking back, listening to the, the pros and cons, especially listening to the cons and the pressures that that produced and having the integrity and, and the, the strength to go forward with that. Because there was a question, you know, I mean, that was a big pressure as to whether or not it would be successful. And indeed, once you 
stepped over the line and made that commitment, it, it was a, 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 a important thing to the state. Had it, had it failed, it would have been not good. And what no. was your role? No, nothing other than talking about it, supporting it, and thinking, too, that it was uh, a good thing for New Jersey. I mean, w w why shouldn't you do it, you know? I mean, it made a lot of sense. It was in place, at least the concepts, et cetera. And the only question at that point was, could you get the, the uh, financial support for it? Mm -hmm. Were you at all part of the negotiations with the New Jersey uh, financial community? No, 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 no. Well, let's move to the inaugural. What was that like? <laughs> that was fun to, uh, uh, let's say, I remember the Four Seasons at the ball. The reason why I remember that is my daughters, uh, uh, my kids went to the inauguration too, and they reminded me of the fact that, that uh, they played at the, uh, at the uh, inaugural ball. Uh, what was that like? It was a great day. I mean, uh, what do I remember of it? I remember his speech at the uh, War Memorial Building. I remember... Uh, being uh, happy uh, at, at that that uh, beginning of the of of the administration, that kind of thing. The next day, I think, uh, what did the next day? Again, he was he he, he was always assuming that I was going to go down and work there with him as a lawyer, but I wouldn't do that. When did you tell him that you didn't want to come to Trent? I, I told him that whenever he mentioned it, I, I wouldn't be uh, uh, ungrateful. But, but you know, I had I, I liked being a lawyer as opposed to having that deep, being that deeply enmeshed in uh, public service. All due respect to it, you know, I respect people who do it because it is a big sacrifice. I guess I wasn't willing to make that sacrifice at that point. Well, now as he takes office, uh, the tax issue becomes a very significant uh, part of what he has to do. Yes. Uh, f from yes, your perspective. Yes, because it did become uh, evident that you had to do something to, to, to deal with the, the crisis as it relates to the, the school funding. And, and, you know, it was one of the last states holding out for uh, resisting the income tax. You had the the history of it as it relates to the primary it being a, a, a position and in the general election. And finally, typically of him as he uh, studied the issues and got in, interesting in there too, Leon comes in the picture because he was the treasurer, okay? And again, a great mind and uh, uh, again, a, a guy who, who uh, gave uh, good advice to, to the governor by way of these types of positions. And that was tense to the extent that you knew it was going to be a heavy lift politically. You knew you were going to have people saying that uh, he's a tax and, and spend Democrat, that kind of thing, even back then. Uh, but he had the, uh, and the, uh, the courage and the, the strength to, to uh, go forward with that position and uh, move for the enactment of the uh, income tax. In retrospect, at this stage, did you think the foreseeable future line was a mistake? No, I thought it was fair back then because, again, you, you, you got to put it in the context of, of the 1973 uh, uh, primary campaign and, and, and the campaign. In him, I mean, he was a judge. He was not a... a uh, what shall I say, an investment banker. He had knowledge of, in a general way, of the budgetary process and what was available and what not, what cuts you could make, etc. Because indeed, there was always that possibility that somehow you'd come in, you could come in, manage the budget so well, and deal with the issues and, and move forward. Uh, but as they made those tough decisions, and I wasn't really part of that, uh, 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 process, quite frankly, um, you, you, you had the realization that this is this should be done for the benefit of the state. 
I mean, he could have not done that. He could have used other gimmicks, et cetera, I suppose, back then. But he chose to bite the bullet and go forward. From your position on the outside, how did you perceive the politics of his position? You said that it was going to be very difficult. Yeah, it was obvious that it would be difficult because you had resistance among all the people who had to vote on it, the, the assembly people and the Senate people, the, the, the representatives. They knew that the next time they were running for election, you'd have opponents saying that they enacted the, the income tax and throw them out and then vote for me. Hmm. So you had that there. Now, were you asked for either political advice or to contact some people during the uh, fight? <laughs> yeah, the one thing that he did do for well, he he asked if I would come down and work for the Senate for a short period of time during that controversy, that effort I should I should uh, call it, and I did. I and I've forgotten how long it was maybe from a month or two months did work with him and Dugan and Leon uh, uh, on the political effort to get support for the income tax that finally was enacted. After failing the first time. Yeah. Uh, do you think that the court's decision was the critical piece of that, that the legislature would not have acted without that deadline of, uh, that the court had set for closing the schools? They probably wouldn't have. You know, they probably wouldn't have. That was a, an important help to it. You know, again, under the theory of doing the right thing to respond to it. Well, the yeah. Governor Burns' sort of political standing takes a fairly significant hit as a result of the income One tax fight. One-term burn, right? <laughs> how, how did you see it? Did you see as he is moving... Oh further into his term and people are talking about one term burn and the next election is coming up did you well what what, what happened Don, was you, you saw people uh, now that say distancing them, themselves <laughs> from him a bit you saw uh, other democratic uh, politicians uh, sensing a vulnerability on his part now as it relates to his electability again for a second term, and my memory fades. And, and at this point, too, I'm practicing law. I'm not down there every day, although I probably got down to see him maybe once every two weeks or so, you know, just stop in and talk to him. And we spoke on the phone, and I would travel with him still a little bit. But, but, but you had others coming up wanting to be governor and challenging him in, uh, prospectively in, in the Democratic primary. And I think one of those people, correct me if I'm wrong, was Paul Jordan and then Mayor, who had helped blah, 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 uh, way back then. And there were other candidates, uh, I think Congressman, uh, what per se county? Bro. Pardon me? Bob Rowe. Bob Rowe, I think ran, right? Uh, there were others, too, uh, helped me with it. I've forgotten. Joe Hoffman, one of his cabinet. Joe directors. Hoffman, yes, 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 the Department of Labor. Um, so that was that was a trying time for him. And then you had some people around him, I thought, suggesting that perhaps he ought not run. By this time, he had uh, changed his his staffing at the State House. Uh, you had then my friend uh, John Degden, I think, serving as his chief of staff or counsel to the governor. You had him being a staunch supporter of, 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 of Byrne. And we probably had a couple of meetings, uh, can't remember exactly when, where people were, his inner circle, were discussing the, the, the viability of his candidacy. I laugh because it's funny how uh, things change in people's reaction and sometimes loyalties, if not changed waver or dissipate, but uh, but he, he, he knew he wanted to run again with all the, the uh, obvious pressure or, or naysaying that he probably heard or read about and uh, agreed to again be a candidate and we became involved with that process too. By we I mean myself and my law firm at that point because at that point you had Paul Jordan, who was the, the Hudson County Democratic candidate, 
and you had to have a full uh, slate of candidates to to get uh, a position on the on the on the ballot in Hudson County. So I got my dear departed uh, uh, law partner Dave Waters to run for sheriff of Hudson County because that was a key position on the ballot that that year, and we <laughs> we we got. The petition signed and, and actually ran a slate of candidates, lost dramatically, of course, against the Hudson County powerhouse, but did sufficiently well for Brendan Byrne to help him win that primary. And a funny part about that was, too, we, as I believe, uh, my memory, uh, we, we got the 1A line uh, by the then uh, county clerk, Jim Quinn, uh, selecting uh, our line for the number one position that helped us also. And we ran that primary from my law office. Again, at that point, I was still over the shoe store in, 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 in uh, Journal Square and had some fun with it. And it's always fun when you win, too, so we won. So it was kind of an extra uh, 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 good result. Was well, what was Mayor Fitzpatrick's position in that uh, election? You know, certainly, certainly he, he, he had to be hoping, if not being out front with, with uh, Brendan Brown. I don't recall, Don. I don't okay. recall. Okay. What advice were you giving Brendan Byrne about the decision to run or not? Oh, well, I, I thought I should run. I mean, you know, it would be like, uh, it would be, I wouldn't say crazy, but having what he, having known the effort that he put into it, having known what he accomplished in that first term, having known the man, I mean, he almost had a responsibility to run, I think. Would have been very disappointing if he chose not to run. Of course, the candidates uh, against him split the vote so much that it obviously helped win the primary for Brendan Byrne. Yes. Why don't you think they got together uh, to try to push a few of them out? Maybe they weren't smart enough to do that. I don't know. Uh, but that's the way it evolved. And, and uh, he won and went on to victory against Bateman, I think, right? And that, too, showed that maybe the people of, of New Jersey are better than back then people thought they were. You look at the recent elections, I think that that's still there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a great state. The people are, I think, very intelligent, by and large, certainly. And that election, according to most analysts, uh, turned when the Bateman-Simon plan was unveiled uh, in terms of an alternative to the income tax. Yeah, yeah. What was yeah. your reaction? Well, you had hoped that that would be the case. Uh, but we were, you know, our position was what it was. You couldn't change it. We had done it, so to speak. And people, I guess, appreciated the fact that uh, it was the right thing, ultimately, because he did win. <laughs> <laughs> at, at what point in the campaign were you confident that he would win? The second time. Second. I don't think I was ever confident that he would win in the second time around. Not until frankly. election day. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. When you saw the polling, I guess, at that point back then, too, you'd have a more of a, uh, a uh, degree of confidence. But it wasn't the same. I mean, the first time around, it was like so obvious that he was going to win. It was never, never entered my mind that, we, that we, he would lose. And again, what was election day and election night like? That was different. Uh, I remember then, it's funny how things stick out in your mind. I remember the, the, then you had the Rocky movie and you had that great soundtrack of the, of the Rocky movies. I've forgotten what it sounds like, but it was something like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not a comeback, but... Uh, Whatever that theme song is, right. that was the same song. It was very invigorating, certainly. And it was different then because, uh, um, why? It was different. I, I guess you knew that that was it. He was going to go forward, and it was fine. 
Now, in the second term, you yeah. took on a couple assignments uh, from Brendan Byrne. Yeah, he talked me into becoming the chairman of the Hudson County uh, Study Commission, not the Hudson County, the Hudson River Walk, the Hudson River Study Commission. I've forgotten the name of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at any rate, it was a commission that he put in place. Uh, luckily for me, uh, I did say I'd be the chairman of it. It had such a vast involvement of all the politicians and the public interest groups. It was a committee of about a thousand, I think. It was really almost humorous to the extent that you had so many people participating in it. It was a challenge to try to get them together to ever render a report, ultimately, because we had hearings. And, and I was blessed with the help of uh, the then uh, employee at the DEP, John Weingart, who is now the chairman of the uh, uh, Highlands uh, Study Com the Highland Commission, Highlands uh, uh, Preservation Commission. And he was, again, so bright and so smart. He, he really actually r wrote the report ultimately and was very helpful in that whole process. And the process was, was sometimes humorous because you had all these politicians who would get up at the public hearings that we had and make speeches about what to do with uh, coordinating the development of the Hudson River. The one thing that we did come out of that with, and right now I think it's a permanent improvement to the state, was the uh, enactment, not enactment, but the recommendation that there be a Hudson River walkway that would connect along the Hudson River uh, among all the towns and the uh, counties, as it the, the county as it relates to making that public space and uh, making it available to the to the public and as we speak now with the development along uh, the Hudson River, that, that commission set that standard and that recommendation. Mm -hmm. And there is a report someplace, I, I don't have it handy. And of course another initiative of the Byrne administration was the development of Liberty State Park yes. in Jersey yes. City, yes. which helped yes. uh, revive yes. the yes. waterfront in the That was all, all part of it. That process began with him having the foresight of the vision, as they say nowadays, of, of having that commission to study what ought to be done. And then uh, the governor appointed you to a very prestigious board. Uh, discuss that appointment well, in your discussions. Well, that was, uh, I think, around the early 80s. He said, why don't you go on the Port Authority? And, uh, you know, usually I would say, no, nah, I don't think so. But he said, well, why don't you do it? And I, and I did agree to do that because he thought that maybe that would be a a help to him, quite frankly, and a good experience for myself. And I did that for a couple of years. It was interesting to the extent, as I think about 9-11 now, uh, of making the meetings over there at, at the World Trade Center. And, and I think about, uh, back then we were thinking about privatizing the World Trade Center. The big issue then was, uh, uh, again, budgetary concerns for both states, whether or not we ought, pr back then, privatize uh, the, the ownership of the World Trade Center. Uh, that failed. It never got the final uh, support of both governors. Interestingly, though, uh, while I was a commissioner, one of my daughters, Janet, was married, and we had her reception at the Windows on the World, uh, which is memorable to, memorable to the family, especially given the 9-11 event. But that was another interesting experience I had, uh, thanks to him. It was only for a couple of years. And I think he, uh, I left to let someone else take that position. But it was, it was fun, too. Yeah. A lot of work. The, the commissioners do a lot of work. It's a very well-run uh, organization. And if you look at the quality, I think, anyway, of the public employee over there, they're exceptional. Of course, Governor Byrne occasionally had battles with the Port Authority, didn't he? Yes, yes. For instance, he wouldn't let them raise, raise the path fare. That, I was there during that battle, and that was a good thing, too. He, he was uh, firmly committed to keeping that, not raising the path fare. Now, you were sort of in the middle there. I assume that you were lobbied by the rest of the commissioners to try to change his mind on that, weren't you? Uh, yes, but... That wouldn't have occurred. I, mean, I agreed with that at that time. Yeah, you yeah. agreed with Burn. his position. Oh yes, yeah, yes, right, right. I thought it was fair, quite frankly. 
<laughs> with, with all the complexity of the two state involvement, I thought that that wasn't a bad, hard position to take at the time. Okay. Uh, what were your contacts with him in the, in the second term? Were they social or uh, mostly they, through the? They changed. They changed to the extent that that you know he he was he knew what he was doing. Uh, obviously, he, and uh, I was quite frankly, and again, I think because of the of my connection and involvement with him, the law practice flourished. Quite frankly, we you know we did well. Uh, the law practice grew. We moved out here. We 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 uh, really did an awful lot of uh, uh, real estate development work as as a law firm. Uh, the one thing that was interesting, and that was uh, fun too, uh, the enactment of the casino uh, legislation in, in Atlantic City, when when that was uh, enacted, and you had that excitement. Uh, when was that? I guess nineteen what eighty. No, earlier seventies. Yeah, yeah, eight, but but it's, they started to build them, I think, in 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 uh, eighty, and I remember being uh, engaged uh, uh, by uh, Bally to represent their interest in that uh, licensing process procedure. Mm -hmm. That was a fun thing too. Fun to the extent, again, serious and and important to the state but also intellectually stimulating and interesting because of the new business you know, and the whole excitement about it. That was good. Looking back at some of those major initiatives during those years, Atlantic City, the Meadowlands, uh, we didn't talk about the Pinelands, that's somewhat different. Well, but, he uh, did that too. He did that too. Uh, any sort of regrets, do you say, like in the Meadowlands, do you think the Meadowlands development has um, no. fulfilled its promise? Yes, I have. I think that was a, a, a very, very wise thing. I think uh, what you see around you here and what it's meant to me because I practice the Senate in the Meadowlands is very important. It, it made the quality of life for people like me at the time living in Jersey City uh, better as it relates to the uh, development that took place in the district. Uh, if there is a regret, and I think we had that conversation, both him and myself, he, he, he should have, and, and we did talk about it, enacted a similar thing in, in Atlantic City for the development, the build-out of Atlantic City. It would have been, uh, I thought, well, you can't knock it to the extent that it's had a lot of positive, uh, obviously, uh, uh, benefit to the, to the state. But you, you probably could have done that better by way of a, a land use regulation system similar to this back then. Done. Similar to the Metal Lands Yes, Commission. right. That would have. Again, maybe you couldn't have done it politically, you know, but, but it would have been better. I think he'd tell you that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and talk briefly, Ken, before we close about your contacts with Brendan Burns since he left office. Well, they're few, always very pleasant. Uh, always uh, 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 reminiscing about uh, uh, our involvement. Any other final thoughts or comments? Or no, I th I think uh, you got look you got to look at uh, what he's accomplished. Okay, why don't we end here? Thank you.